this will be just a brief conversation. It's, uh, you know, we always get to hear him, thank you, uh, talk about his time here at Michigan. But there's questions that I think we all have. If we could just have a dinner with him, what would we ask him? Uh, and I, 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 one of the things that, I have a few questions, but I was sitting in the back thinking about when I first got to meet you and Miss Faye Burton gave me a call. I don't know how many of you remember Miss Faye Burton. And she said, I'm calling on behalf of Dean Patterson. And when you come to this campus, we want to see you in this office. And you know I reported right there. And that was my first exposure to this man. And I, I immediately knew uh, from what I learned instantly getting on this campus that I would give him my honor and respect in whatever way I could. I never hear about your parents. I'm curious. You were raised here in Ann Arbor. When I, I always, when I travel around and work with young people, I, say, I always say I can tell from whence they've come because they have given so much in their love and gifts. So when I think about you and your greatness, I just would love for you to tell us what were your parents like? What did they do? Who were they? Because they produce an amazing human being. Well, uh, <laughs> I, I have to laugh uh, when I think about how to respond to that question. Uh, I was born out of wedlock by my mother who had just recently come by bus with her parents from Birmingham, Alabama. Um, after a failed marriage, early failed marriage, and became very acquainted with a handsome gentleman who uh, was short of stature and deep of voice. <laughs> uh, from Ypsilanti, by the name of Edward Curtis. Uh, he was prolific in that he had a family in Ypsilanti with eight children. Uh, and in between the first and second, see, the, sec the third child, the third girl, and the other five youngsters was born out of his association with Kathleen Gully, Willis Patterson. Uh, she was very, very uh, musical, wonderful soprano voice, lovely lady. I knew very little of my father. He was uh, uh, a woman's man <laughs> and uh, stayed home long enough to uh, impregnate his wife with yet another child. Uh, this, this would be um, having had you asked me this question 40 years ago, this would be a subject of some uh, intense embarrassment. Uh, but I got to know my father for a total of about 25 minutes, separated between two uh, meetings, and I came to have great admiration for him and his very gentle and genial fashion and attitude toward me, as well as his offsprings of uh, other, the eight other Curtises, who all treated me as if I had been born in their midst and in, uh, been raised in their warmth. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that. I think about you coming here from your past universities back as a professor, being the first uh, African-American faculty member here at the School of Music, Theater, and Dance. 
And I don't know if many people would have done the work that you did. And I'm curious what factors, those of us who are in academia still trying to do the work that you did so many years ago, what factors would you say were pivotal to you navigating this political uh, world here in Ann Arbor? Um, I'm glad you asked that question, but then again, as I begin to form an answer to that, a response to that, you know, we don't have very much time. Uh, I, I could ask, I could request that the ushers lock the doors <laughs> and prevent you from avoiding hearing this entire story, but I won't be, uh, bore you and burden you with an entire story, although it is to me uh, of some interest. In fact, the book that uh, uh, Mr. Mons, or prefer Dr. Mons, uh, made mention of it in his introduction, the saga. Yes. Um, I, I go through this in rather great detail. My <clears throat> absence from an experience with African Americans in general, there were very few of us in Ann Arbor in 1930, uh, and, and in music in particular, left me bereft of any real inspiration, in, in information and experience with um, the African-American musical tradition, save for that which was practiced in my church, the Second Baptist Church in Ann Arbor, small congregation with a lively, forceful leader named Reverend C.W. Carpenter from uh, the graduate of Tuskegee Institute who was a strong disciplinarian. And I remember our singing in the Blue Cron Choir as a child, uh, and his stopping in the midst of his sermon and then admonishing us from, from being distractive because we were right in front of the congregation. And he'd, he'd say, and God said, would have stopped that. Uh, and I wasn't the only one. Every, everyone in the choir was uh, a little distractive. Yeah. But uh, the, the experience that I had, that I alluded to in my little presentation at uh, Southern University and Virginia State College was a real epiphany for me. I had not been in the community of scholars, let alone musical, musically accomplished people, ever. And there I was for the first two years in, southern, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana at Southern University you know, on a faculty that had no fewer than five doctoral degrees. One gentleman who taught the, the choir was had two doctoral degrees, one from the University of Pennsylvania and the other from Columbia University. He was indeed a choral conductor. Um, the, the theory teacher, Timothy Ashford, had a doctoral degree from Juilliard. Um, there were wonderful performers um, and, and the pedagogues and out of the music department, there were several in other disciplines who had doctoral degrees from the University of Michigan. It, it is ironic to understand that segregation in those days meant that the historically black colleges had the pick, if you pardon this term, of the litter of graduates from the major colleges and universities who were African American. So that faculty at Southern University had a plethora of very accomplished scholars. And I found myself in the midst of these people uh, and as, as a young person, uh, totally novice, I was astounded to be so blessed and so situated. 
Yeah. However, I must tell you one little anecdote that occurred to me. Um, the experience was that the, the president of the university, Dr. Felton G. Clark, had the habit of wanting to have the new faculty for every year who were, were, were going to be in the music uh, department to perform at the initial convocation. And those, those schools had a, a tradition of a convocation and a Vesper service every week to which all students were required to attend. Uh, that was a tradition that was quickly abandoned a few years later uh, under the force of uh, the students who felt they could use the time otherwise. <laughs> In any event, um, that first convocation, I shall never forget the convocation, I shall never forget was on Wednesday at noon. And um, all of the freshmen at that time, Southern University was a large, had the largest number of uh, uh, undergraduate uh, African-American students in the country. And there were about 3,000 of them crowded into the gymnasium. And uh, I had been asked to sing. Uh, my accompanist was also new to the faculty. He was from Boston University uh, by the name of Buckner Gamby and he had been asked to play as my accompanist. We had rehearsed. And uh, I went to the gymnasium with Mr. Gamby, and he, uh, uh, Felton Clark introduced us. I walked out, and I had a culture shock. I had never in my life seen that many of my people <laughs> gathered in one place and I didn't know how to recover from that shock. I said to myself, are there that many of us here? <laughs> In Ann Arbor, there were so few. Well, I had chosen Il Lacerato Spirito from Simon Bocanegra to do the, be the operatic aria, and he wanted me also, Felton Clark wanted me also to sing Deep River. So I decided I'd start with Simon Bocanegra's Il Lacerato Spirito. For those of you who know that aria, there's a ponderous and lengthy introduction that ends in the piano, that ends with ta -da! But I hadn't recovered from my cultural shock yet. <laughs> so Mr. Gamby went all the way through the introduction again. And he got to those two chords, and he did tong, tong. And he looked at me, and I began. <laughs> so that, uh, that was my introduction to that brand new sensation of being among my people in music. And from that time, to the end of my two years there, I feasted and grew immensely. And when I went to Virginia State College, it was only intensified, where I met even more accomplished African-American musicians of, of uh, equal uh, facility as performers and as scholars and academicians. academicians. While Having that experience, it occurred to me that the University of Michigan seemed not to be aware that there were these quality of musicians and individuals in these institutions. And so that was the inspiration for my wanting to put together an occasion where they could be exposed to my alma mater. And so we had them here for about a week. They, we, I had them all across the campus. 
in and out of churches and auditoria. We did performances at Power Center, Hill Auditorium, um, Lydia Mendelssohn, uh, the School of Music, whatever, wherever we had a venue, that's where we, that's where we were, either with panels and, and discussions or uh, with performances. And we wound up uh, with uh, a major dinner at the Michigan Union in the ballroom. That was the final event. I have one last question before I, we go home after this wonderful evening. You know, when I think about you here as an administrator, a soloist, a voice teacher, a conductor, first conductor of the Men's Glee Club, I, I'm curious, you, when I met you, you were always working on something. I always, when I got around Dean Patterson, I was always nervous because I knew he was working on something constantly. And I'm curious, first, if there's something you're working on now, and if not, what would you be working on if you weren't retired? Well, I, I am working on something. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, and it's even more pleasurable because it's a retrospective of performances that I've been a part of over the years, the recordings of them, a reel to reel. I have about oh, three or four hundred reel to reel recordings um, and uh, maybe a thousand cassette recordings of students. Um, and I've, I've decided that I'm going to make of those a gift to the University of Michigan because they all uh, do a wonderful documentation of African-American music activities here at the University of Michigan, but also across the country. Um, uh, so that's, that's really had me uh, occupied, uh, in fact, over-occupied for the past uh, six months, and it's probably gonna take me another uh, six months to get them all on one uh, hard disk, or two hard disks, or three hard disks. Thank you. Before we say good night, we what, know that. Just, we, just before we yes. say good night, <laughs> I want to turn the tables on you. <laughs> you have been um, at a very spectacular career at the University of Michigan in your, what is it, three years now? Going uh, on your third year? My ninth year. Your ninth year? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I forget, I've been retired for 21 years. So it's a... Second year in this position. Yes. yes. But um, I've been mightily impressed by the fact that you have not only become the second conductor of, uh, of color of the Mich Michigan Men's Glee Club, uh, but you've also now become the head of choral music conducting here at the School of Music. And you've come up with this wonderful choral ensemble, which you assemble maybe three or four days before their concerts. I understand you just did a Carnegie Hall concert with them of called Exigence. Exigence. Wonderful choral combination of uh, how many singers? Uh, right now, 21 black and Latinx. Singers. Yes. Uh, of, of soloists who really wind up um, uh, making a wonderful choral, blended, refined sound of unusual 20th century choral music. And I want to ask you, how, how do you feel about that combination? <laughs> That accomplishment. I'm going to keep it short and say I'm trying to keep up with you. <laughs> I'm trying my best. We know beside every great man is a great man or female, and beside this man is Mrs. Patterson. And let's please honor her tonight. Please. Dean Patterson, Mrs. Patterson, let's give them our honor, please. Good night, everyone. Thank you.